In the past two days during the Mass, we've heard this section of the Gospel taken from the same farewell discourse of our Lord found at the beginning of John chapter 14. We heard the first part on Friday. Yesterday, we heard the second part, and, to do, and today, Sunday, we hear those two parts put together. On Friday, we mentioned the context of this discourse. Jesus is speaking to his disciples at the Last Supper. They were worried about him leaving them, and they were troubled that the Lord had just told Peter that he was going to deny him three times. That's John 13, 38. They were also fearful about the future as well, a future that they thought they'd have to face without Jesus there, without him being their guide, without him being there to protect them. So how does Jesus start talking to them about his departure? Well, interestingly, he tells them not to worry. Then he explains his death in a strange way. He explains his death in the light of a marriage feast. How often do we think of Jesus's death in terms of, of a marriage feast, probably about uh, as often as the disciples did, which means uh, not often enough. We already remember at the beginning of St. John's Gospel that Jesus started his public ministry with Our Lady by performing the first miracle, his first miracle, at a wedding, a wedding in Cana, John chapter 2. Then in the next chapter, John chapter 3, we hear we heard the Baptist, we hear the Baptist call Jesus the bridegroom. He says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands with, stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice, said John about Jesus, John 3, verse 29. And then in the chapter following, chapter 4, Jesus was speaking with a Samaritan woman at the well, at a well. And a well was often a place of encounter and a place of courtship in ancient Israel. It wasn't uncommon for men to go to wells in search for a bride. And so now Jesus, in the 14th chapter of this same gospel, consoles the disciples by telling them that everything that's going to happen to him is all part of the wedding preparation. It's all part of the preparations. We'll try to give a brief explanation of that. In Jesus' time, when there was a wedding, it was customary for the groom to leave his betrothed at her parents' house, at her place of origin, and then go and prepare a home for her in his own city. So he would leave her home, and he would go to his home, to his city, to prepare a place for her. He would prepare the new home and prepare a feast for her, and then usually he'd return at night to escort his bride to the wedding and to their new home. Even in one of Jesus' parables, we remember the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, even there, we remember Jesus saying, you know, at midnight there was a cry, Behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him, Matthew 25, verse 6. So after telling his disciples not to be troubled, to have faith in God and have faith in him, Jesus says to his disciples in John 14, 2, verses 2 and 3, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, said Jesus. That's marriage talk in ancient Israel. Even if you step back one chapter in John chapter 13, what does Jesus do before the Passover or during the Passover meal? St. John says this, he said, quote, He rose from supper, laid aside his garments, tied a towel around himself, and began to wash the disciples' feet, John 13, verses 4 and 5. The gesture of washing the feet was a gesture of service and of hospitality and of humility, but it was even more than that. It even ties into the, the theme of the marriage. How is that? Well, because before marriage, in ancient Israel, again, there was a ceremonial washing of the bride that would take place. You know, before the bride would be adorned, she would... Of course, she would be adorned as a queen, would. But before that, there was actually a ceremonial washing of her, and her hair would be braided with as many precious stones as the family had or could borrow. And all this was in preparation for the big marriage celebration. It even brings to mind something that the Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians when speaking on marriage. He says this, he says, Ephesians, Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, 
that he might present the church to himself in splendor, says the apostle. So Jesus wants to present his bride to himself in splendor. So before he tells his disciples that he's going to prepare a place for them, just like a bridegroom would go and prepare a place for his bride, he also, again, he performs that ceremonial washing, in this case, the washing of their feet. And if we listen to what St. Paul says, he says that Christ cleansed the church, them, us, by the washing of water with the word, St. Paul says. What does that remind us of? The washing of water with the word? It's a reference, of course, to the sacrament of baptism, where we are cleansed of our sins by water and by the pronouncing of the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Another important element of the ancient Jewish wedding was the procession at the end of the day. The bridegroom would set out from his house in order to fetch his bride, again, from her parents' home. And so he would arrive at the house, and the bride, when he arrived, she would be wearing a veil. She'd be wearing her veil. Then the veil would be taken off and laid on the shoulder of the bridegroom, and then these words would be pronounced, The government shall be upon his shoulder. The government shall be upon his shoulder. My guess is that meant that the government of the family or and the home now rested on the shoulder of the bridegroom, of the husband. And then, the, of course, the procession from there would head out and to the couple's new home with the dark road lit by oil lamps held by the wedding guests. What sticks out again in that, uh, what I mentioned there, when he says, the government shall be upon his shoulder, where do those words even come from? They actually come from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6. We hear that at Christmas time, uh, and it's even one of the hymns in Handel's Messiah. Isaiah 9, verse 6 reads this, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's a messianic text talking about the birth of Christ. The government will be upon his shoulder. Why? Because he's not just the Messiah, but he's also the bridegroom as well. So again, what's happening in today's gospel in the farewell discourse? Jesus is telling his disciples not to worry. Just like a bridegroom leaves the home of the bride to go to his city to prepare a place for both of them to, to live, so too Jesus is leaving his bride's home. He's leaving earth, which is our temporary home. He's leaving and he's going back to his father's house, to his heavenly home, to paradise, where he will prepare a place for his bride. That's how he begins by calming his disciples. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. John 14, verses 2 and 3. Again, that's marriage talk in ancient Israel. And according to Jewish custom, there was also a lapse of time between the marriage contract being made and the presentation of the bride to her husband didn't all just happen in the same day. For us, the time of the contract that we made with Jesus, the bridegroom, was when? It was at baptism, when we were cleansed again by the water and the word. And the time for the final presentation of the bride will be when? It'll be at the second coming of Jesus, at the end of the world. Even the phrase, the second coming of Jesus, uh, ties into that marriage theme. The bride comes to earth in his first coming. He comes and makes a marriage contract. He comes and makes a covenant with his bride-to-be. He did that for us, of course, by dying on the cross. Then he leaves the earth at his ascension, and then he will come back at the end of time to bring his bride with him to their new home, to bring us with him to our eternal home. So knowing all of this, hopefully... It makes it a little under, easier to understand why Jesus said that at the resurrection, we will neither marry nor be given in marriage, he says in Matthew 22, verse 30. Why? Because we won't have a need or even a desire to be married to just one person. We'll actually be wedded to God. We'll be perfectly united to him. We'll be complete in him. As the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 54, verse 5, he says, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. So how can we apply 
this to our spiritual life, I think very simply by taking to heart what we've said in the past, I think in a previous homily, that life on this earth is a preparation. It's not a preparation for death. It's a preparation really for a wedding. It essentially is what it's a preparation for. How do we prepare for the heavenly wedding feast? Uh, by living in God's grace, by doing good, and by following the movements of the Holy Spirit. You know, St. Paul says in his letter to the Ephesians, he says, For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He said, Ephesians 2, verse 10. So we are to walk in good works, says the apostle, meaning that we're to live doing good, doing good to others and doing good also for the right reason, you know, for the right reason too. The apostle says, whatever you eat, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. He says, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. So everything that we want to do, we want to do it in the sight of a preparation for our wedding feast, for our preparation for our eternal marriage with the Lord. And whatever sufferings or difficulties or hardships that we're experiencing, let's try to learn and let's ask the Lord to help us to see all these things as uh, our Lord's way of preparing us for that heavenly wedding feast. So in this month of May, let's ask Our Lady, the spouse of the Holy Spirit, for the grace Again, to see all of life as a preparation for a wedding, for God's wedding with us. As the angel says in the book of Revelation, he says, Write this, blessed are those that are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verse 9. That marriage supper, of course, begins on this earth. It begins in the Mass, where we feast on the Lamb's body and His blood, and it ends in Paradise, where we will possess Jesus we will possess the Lamb, and He will completely possess us. And of course, with Jesus come all the gifts and graces and wonders and joys, which we can, can't even begin to fathom what they are on this earth. As St. Paul says, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love Him. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. So let's use this time on earth to prepare for the heavenly marriage feast.